This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Ewart. It's Tuesday, May 26th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VOA headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on and we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. The World Health Organization is pushing the pause button on the use of hydroxychloroquine in its trials to find effective treatments for the coronavirus, while experts review its safety. WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus cited a study published recently in the medical journal Lancet, in which the authors reported an estimated higher mortality rate among COVID-19 patients who received the drug as the reason for the stoppage. Tedro stresses the drug is acceptable and generally safe for use in patients with autoimmune diseases or malaria. He also says Africa is the region with the fewest diagnosed coronavirus cases, accounting for less than 1.5% of the global total and just 0.01% of deaths. So far, Africa has avoided the worst impacts of COVID-19, but the continent could face a silent epidemic if its leaders do not prioritize testing, according to WHO Special Envoy Samba So. In southern Africa, Mozambique is confirming its first coronavirus, according to the health ministry. It's a 13-year-old with pre-existing medical condition, according to Reuters. Now to Ivory Coast, where thousands of students and teachers have returned to school, becoming one of the first in West Africa to restart after a two-month coronavirus lockdown. Ivory Coast has nearly 2,400 COVID-19 infections. However, authorities are confident students can safely study together following the introduction of added hygiene measures. Adapting to restrictions of social distancing and wearing a face mask to help prevent the spread of coronavirus is adding to the daily struggle for the visually impaired in Nigeria. Angela Kumadu explains. How do you keep social distancing if you cannot see? For Lawal Adebimbe, a 31-year-old baker and aspiring blogger, losing her sight two years ago was hard enough. Now the coronavirus pandemic has made her life in Lagos even more difficult. It's been really, really difficult. Um, when, when the February, when we first had the first case, to us as a visually impaired person, it was like a bomb, or personally with disability. It was like a bomb because for a visually impaired person, I have to depend on people to go out. I have to cross the road. I have to um, walk around, get the bus. The city's lockdown started lifting earlier this month, but national restrictions like mandatory masks and the curfew are still in place. For Lawal, even an everyday activity like crossing the road can even be a struggle because of social distancing. Unlike in other countries, Nigerian traffic lights do not make a sound when pedestrians can cross, and the lights often do not work, leading to her having to rely on friends. Juliet Bafui lost her sight in 2013 and runs the Yeye Do Outreach Foundation for visually impaired people in the capital Abuja. Her charity is trying to help. Using a facial mask is something that is still strange to me and I'm still learning. But these are some, you know, adjustments that I've had to make and all make, sorry. Also washing of hands. I wash my hands very, very often. As often as I touch surfaces or touch people for help. That was Angela Okumadu of Reuters reporting. Isli residents in Nairobi, a predominantly Somali neighborhood, celebrated Eid, the end of Ramadan, in lockdown after the government extended the movement in and out of the area for another two weeks. Some families say they have never experienced an Islamic celebration like this one. Muhammad Yusuf reports. This is what Eid al-Fitri celebration looks like in Isli, a Somali neighborhood in Kenya's capital, Nairobi. 
The ban on movement because of the coronavirus has dampened the spirit of celebration here. Mohammed Osman is celebrating with his family at home. He says this is a different Eid for him and his family. We are at home. We can't go to the market and you cannot purchase a lot of items because everywhere you go, there are security officers around. You cannot go out. For us, business people, we are not allowed to go out. This Eid is very different from previous Eid celebrations. We prayed, but there is no celebration, family gatherings we used to have before. Abdul Shakur Garad opened his clothing business on the day of celebrations, but he could not meet with people. I have never seen an Eid festival like this one where people are not allowed to celebrate together. People are afraid of each other. They don't touch each other, no shaking hands, no visiting homes. In my entire life, I have not encountered an Eid like this. Kenyan authorities closed off the area May 6th after 29 new cases of the coronavirus were found there in a single day. Authorities are allowing medics and food to enter and leave the area. To limit the spread of the virus, Kenya has banned gatherings and ordered the communities to follow health precautions and wear masks in public. Many people are dying and they thought that we really need to take this message very seriously if we need to be saved from this uh, disease. And uh, I want to add, even from the Islamic uh, point of view, Islam pr perspective, uh, there are so many uh, narrations from the Prophet, peace be upon him, Muhammad, that taught us that these are practices that are done when the plague took place many years ago. Last week, Kenyan authorities extended the restriction of movement in the area for another two weeks. The strategy to be able to deal with such you know, situations is to contain or to cordon movement in and out of such areas so that uh, nobody would go in and get infection from there, unknowingly so, and nobody would get out and, and, and uh, distribute that inf infection or spread the infection to other areas. The restriction on its lease is expected to end on June 6th. Mohamed Yusuf for VA News, Nairobi. Around the world, frontline workers such as doctors, medical specialists and other healthcare support providers are the backbone of the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Faced with long hours and overwhelmed health systems, their resilience and dedication is critical in caring for the high number of patients infected with coronavirus. Dr. Linda Mobula is an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and an emergency physician volunteer with Samaritans First in New York City. She shares her experience of being on the front line with Africa 54's health correspondent, Lino Mudu. Dr. Linda Mobula, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Can you give us a sense of uh, what is happening now? New York was a hot spot in the United States, although cases are going down. New York City remains the epicenter of the COVID-19 outbreak in the United States. It has more than 300,000 cases. And in fact, it has more cases than any other country in the world right now. And we have seen a steady decline in the number of admissions that we're getting, as well as in the number of cases. And um, the New York City um, healthcare system was quite overwhelmed with this um, pandemic. There was limited bed capacity. Um, physicians, nurses, healthcare providers were quite overwhelmed with the number of cases that were being admitted. And um, things are getting better, which is a good news, but I think there still needs to be um, a lot of vigilance regarding a, a potential spike or second wave. I think it's important to maintain social distancing measures, um, but also just to be sure that people stay at home so that we don't see another increase in the number of cases. What is your uh, take on the impact that uh, this is having on your colleagues, on you, and uh, how do you personally handle this? It's exhausting, I think, to work on this response. Wearing PPE for several hours um, takes a toll. We, my colleagues and I have worked 100 hours a week for the past several weeks, and fatigue um, is, is, is something that comes up. Um, fear, I think, as well. I think we have to acknowledge that. 
the fear of um, becoming infected, but also um, I think it, it does t have an effect on, on one's mental health as indicated by the suicide of, of our dear colleague that, that just uh, took her life. And I think it's important um, to encourage healthcare providers every, every day in New York City at 7 p.m., everybody claps for healthcare providers. There's been um, overwhelming support for healthcare providers. And I think we need to continue doing that, not just now, but once the, the outbreak is over, once the pandemic is over, to continue to provi provide that support because they will, we all need it. Their healthcare providers are separated from their families and that have been separated for a long time. And usually when you're going through a crisis, your family's around to support you. And when you don't have that, I think that does take a toll. You know, the isolation, the long hours, um, the number of deaths, the number of cases that we're seeing have all affected healthcare providers. So I encourage everyone to continue to provide support to, to all healthcare workers because they are in fact heroes. This is a, a word that we see now that is being used to call healthcare workers heroes. And you mentioned how people are clapping at 7 p.m. to encourage you. Beyond this, beyond the clapping, the cheering, the mm -hmm. heroes calling, what else can make your work easier at this point? Ensuring that um, there is that, that support that, that, that is provided to healthcare providers in terms of you know, personal protective equipment, um, just equipment, um, but also making sure that staffing um, is, is adequate. For, for all these healthcare providers who are working on long hours. Today we're seeing that uh, although the outbreak is on, is on the continent, Africa remains the region with less case compared to the rest of the world. What do you make of this? Just because Africa doesn't have as many cases as Europe or the United States doesn't, does not mean that um, in the future it won't. I think there's, a, there's definitely a risk that Africa could become the next epicenter. And we're seeing an exponential rise in the number of COVID-19 cases in Africa, with South Africa having the highest number of cases. So I think we need to, again, be very cautious about the prevalence of COVID-19. There, there could be, um, it could be that um, we're not testing enough people so we need to increase the number of tests that we're doing. We need to be able to detect cases uh, much, much better than we are right now. I think mitigation measures are really important. Social distancing, I think, in Africa and lockdown, I think, are co two concepts that will look different in Africa. You cannot ask people to stay at home for weeks and weeks without providing them with, with food. So food security is going to be something that we need to look at differently in low and middle income countries, specifically um, on the African continent. And there have been multiple people that I've written that I've been thinking about how to adapt strategies in Africa. Um, because these same strategies, the, the same interventions that might work in one country might not necessarily work in Africa. So providing that additional support, um, and, and I focus on food security a lot because I think it's gonna be extremely important to provide um, support, that type of support to families if you're asking them to stay at home. Dr. Mobula says routine food distribution in countries and communities in Africa that are experiencing food insecurity should be a key aspect to the response against COVID-19 to ensure that people stay home as needed. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24 seven on voaafrica.com still to come. Economically empowering young women in Nigeria through fashion. We'll be right back after this break. Chibana, <laughs> 
Welcome back to Africa 54. The global COVID-19 pandemic is causing major anxiety for many people. Some are finding treatment via online therapy. Dina Mitchell reports. The COVID-19 pandemic has shuttered in-person therapy sessions and forced some people facing unemployment and other stressors online for help. I was on a Zoom call with about, I think like 30 of us, and the head of the agency let everybody go on the Zoom call super traumatizing. <laughs> I was kind of like, I think I might need to see someone based on my anxiety levels. Um, I'm not able to self-regulate as much as I normally am. Almost half of adults in the United States reported worry and stress because the virus has taken a toll on their mental health, according to a recent poll by the Kaiser Family Foundation. Social isolation, loneliness, all of that is deeply connected to, to poor mental health outcomes. And the hardest hit are going to be folks like older adults that are living alone, um, children and teens, frontline workers. As a result of the sharp incline in need, many therapists and mental health workers are now offering telehealth services, communicating through digital technology such as a computer tablet or smartphone. We've switched almost everything to telehealth and virtual care video visits. We're back to back with patients and it's overwhelming. Art therapist Julie Catelli says she is even using telehealth with her child patients who are also experiencing increased anxiety. Connection is what makes us human and it makes it's what creates our lives and all of these connections that we have outside of our home to friends and community and school and our job and our relatives has all kind of been diminished. Since her job loss, Wong has been utilizing online therapy and says she sees no reason to go back to in-person visits. A few years ago, I don't know if I would have been as open to an app or a Zoom call with a therapist. But now that I've done this, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I really don't feel the need to go into an office to do it again. I will say that the person who I'm seeing online, she's been really positive and given me a lot of tools to kind of help me during this time, so. Like having a regular routine and exercise, limiting exposure to the media and connecting with others. Of course, not everyone has internet or is comfortable talking online, particularly older people, says Schmidt, and it can be pricey, even with insurance. Actually, some of the, the folks that maybe are hardest hit, maybe there's no internet connection, maybe they've had to shut their internet off, and with loss of insurance, right, we're seeing people lose their coverage. There are some free support groups available online, like a Facebook group called the Free Public Support Group to manage coronavirus anxiety. For VOA News, Dina Mitchell, Oakland, California. The United States is slowly opening state by state after weeks of staying at home because of coronavirus. The pandemic is changing life for most people especially how and when they receive medical treatment. Some may find their doctors have disappeared. VOA's Caroline Prasuti reports. Dr. Mike Wilson is home in Texas and back to being a dad of seven kids. It is a far cry from the past month when he served as medical director of this New York City field hospital. He first spoke with VOA when he was midway through working five weeks straight. This is day 22, you know, 14 hour days with no day off yet. When coronavirus numbers dropped in New York, Dr. Wilson returned home to his Texas hospital group and found himself unemployed. There's a lack of patients to be seen, so they don't need the staff. So nurses and physicians across the country have been laid off, um, uh, furloughed. In April, at the height of the pandemic, America's private healthcare industry laid off 1.4 million workers. Here's how that happened. When the pandemic hit, hospitals canceled lucrative elective surgeries to make room for COVID patients. 
smaller hospitals, already struggling financially, were pushed to the brink. Additionally, regular emergency room admissions dropped dramatically as Americans feared entering the hospitals that were handling COVID-19 patients. Dr. Ruchita Gandhi treated a female stroke patient who delayed coming to the emergency room until it was too late. We could see this clot and it was massive and just all of us just felt this terrible sense of this is one of the cases that we really could have made a huge impact on. This woman had, if she had come within 24 hours, we probably could have pulled that clot. With patients avoiding the ER and revenue down, hospitals cut staff. Some rural hospitals now operate with just one or two doctors in the emergency room. That's not enough people. Dr. K.K. Moody founded MDOCs, a group of 23,000 emergency physicians. She says her members run the risk of being fired if they complain their facilities are understaffed. If there is a multi-car pileup just outside the hospital, we need people there. We don't know when the surge is going to happen. We don't know when the emergencies will happen, so we have to be always ready. Dr. Moody says America's hospitals have always faced financial storms but now they are struggling in a hurricane. This is not just an industry. This has become an industry and it should not be. It should be about one human taking care of another human. The $2 trillion coronavirus relief bill passed in March provided $100 billion for hospitals to recoup lost revenue. Oh, thank you very much. But that you, hasn't Edward. helped Dr. Wilson, who is polishing his resume. The first time he's done that in years. Carolyn Prasuti, VOA News. Unemployed women in Nigeria often feel alone and isolated, but in Lagos, Abiola Idowu, owner and lead designer of Ojufin Fashion, is using her skills to empower underprivileged women in her community. She trains young girls and women to sew and create their small businesses. Africa 54's Paul Ndiho spoke to Idowu about empowering women by using passion. Abiola Idowu, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you. It's my pleasure being here. As an entrepreneur running a fashion business in Lagos, how has COVID-19 affected your business? It has affected me in so many ways. We were home for four weeks. We couldn't work for four weeks. We had to lock down our shops, sent uh, our workers home, and then, uh, you know, we stopped productions and so many things. As a fashion designer, were you able to innovate for COVID? The government said we should use was the face, the nose mask. So we were able to produce some of it. I produced a lot. I produced over 100, um, over 100 pieces, and people, I gave some out and I was able to make money from it, so I sold some. So I was able to do that, and then I was able to do online classes for my students, too, for the, for the women that I, I can pattern and teach. So let's talk about uh, the women uh, that uh, uh, you uh, impart. Uh, uh, how many are they, and uh, for how long have you been doing this? Uh, so many of them come to you looking to learn about fashion. Uh, why are they particularly interested in becoming fashion designers? The whole idea is to empower them, is to make them have something doing. And some of them have flair, passion for fashion. So when they come, they come, we look at the outline. Some of them are not even educated. Some of them can't speak. But uh, you know, I have a way of uh, teaching them, imparting them, and a lot of them are really getting it. I want women, women, women to be empowered. A lot of them out there just relying on their husband for everything, especially African women. They are relying on him for everything. So, so sometimes the man is even worked up. He transferred the aggression on them, and he, sometimes it turns to physical abuse and so many things like that. There are lots of them like that I have met and have encouraged them to come. Some of them will be like, I don't have money to learn. How will, how will I go to somewhere without money? I just tell them to come. Those women, when they come to you, what is it that they are looking for? Some of them don't even know what they want at first. You know, they just, but by the time I sit them down, 
I have one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. They are getting their life in a proper way. I tell them, this is how to do it. You can do it. It takes time. Be patient with yourself. You can achieve it. Just take it gradually, one step at a time. And before you know it, they are happy. I tell them, start with the people in your area. Make little dresses for them. Make for your niece, make for your sisters, make for your brothers. Before you see it, someone will see it and like it on them. Then they will refer them to you. It's not as rosy as I am saying it, though. But we have success story each time. Mm. Uh, how many success stories do you have? How many people have gone through uh, your uh, fashion school uh, that are successful, that are doing something on their own? Here to this year, I have four people that have established. But people that have taught that have passed through me are over, let me say, over over 100 students now since when I've started. When I talked to you, you said you use fashion as a way of expressing yourself. Yeah. Uh, what did you mean exactly? Using it to express myself means fashion is me. It's like my life. It's what I live for. I, I preach fashion to people. It's not necessarily you having billions of naira in your account before you can look good. You can look good with my simple outfit and the little money. What lessons have you learned uh, uh, from this period when you're at home and seated and wondering about how this is going to affect your business and what you can do to improve your business? I've, I've learned a lot of lessons in the fact that uh, I need to do more online. So I'm really working on my uh, social media handle so that people can really, really know what I do, not just my area alone now, so that they can know it all over the world. What keeps you going? The love for the for the business and then my husband keeps me going. You know, at times when I come home, he says, I'm, I'm just transferring all the aggression on him, but he understands. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. That was Africa 54's Pondiho speaking to Abiola Idowu, owner and lead designer of Jufin Fashion in Lagos, Nigeria. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching.